Part Two of Electra by Sophocles, translated by Lewis Campbell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part Two. <sighs> Think you the wretch in heartfelt agony weeps inconsolably her perished son? She left us with a laugh. Oh, misery! How thou hast ruined me, dear brother mine, by dying! Thou hast torn from out my heart the only hope I cherished yet, that thou living wouldst come hereafter to avenge thy father's woes and mine. Where must I go? since I am left of thee and of my sire bereaved and lonely, and once more must be the drudge and menial of my bitterest foes, my father's murderers. Say, is it well? Nay, never more will I consort with these, but sinking here before the palace gate, thus friendless, I will wither out my life. Hereat, if any in the house be vexed, let them destroy me. For to take my life were kindness, and to live is only pain. Life hath not kindled my desires with joy. O ever-blazing sun, O lightning of the eternal sire, Can ye behold this done, and tamely hide your all-avenging fire? Ah, me! My daughter, why these tears? Woe! Weep not, calm thy fears. You kill me! How? To breathe a hope for one beneath so clearly sunk in death, Choose to afflict me more already pining sore. One in a woman's toils was tangled, buried by her glittering coils, Who now beneath, ah, woe, Rules with a spirit unimpaired and strong. Oh, dreadful, dreadful was the wrong. But she was quelled, I, true, that faithful mourner knew a brother's aid, but I have no man now. The one I had is gone, is gone, wrapped into nothingness. Thou art wrung with sore distress. I know it, too well I know, taught by a life of woe where horror dwells without relief. Our eyes have seen thy grief. Then comfort not again. Whither now turns thy strain? One utterly bereft, seeing no hope is left, Of help from hands owning the same great sire. Tis nature's debt. To expire on sharp-cutting, dragging thongs, Midst wildly trampling throngs of swiftly racing hoofs, Like him, poor hapless one. Vast, dim, and boundless was the harm. Yea, severed from mine arm by strangers kept. Oh, pain! Hidden he must remain, of me unsepulchred, unmourned, unwept. Enter Chrysothemis. Driven by delight, dear sister, I am come, reckless of dignity, with headlong speed, for news I bear of joy and sweet relief, from ills that drew from thee thy ceaseless moan. Whence couldst thou hear of succour for my woes that close in darkness without hope of dawn? Here is Orestes, learn it from my mouth. As certainly as you now look at me. What? Art thou mad, unhappy one, to laugh over thine own calamity and mine? No, by our father's hearth. I say not this in mockery. I tell you he is come. <sighs> me, miserable, who hath given thine ear the word that hath so wrought on thy belief? Myself am the eyewitness. No one else gained my belief, but proofs I clearly saw. What sign hath so engrossed thine eye, poor girl? What sight hath fired thee with this quenchless glow? But list to me, I pray thee, that henceforth thou mayest account me clear-eyed or a fool. By all means, if it pleasure thee, say on. Well, I will tell thee all I saw. I came unto the ancient tomb that holds our sire, and from the topmost mound I marked a stream of milk fresh flowing, and his resting place ringed round with garlands of all flowers that blow. I marveled at the sight, and peered about, lest some one might be nearer than we knew. But finding all was quiet in the spot, I ventured closer to the tomb, and there, hard by the limit, I beheld a curl of hair new-shorn, with all the gloss of youth, and straight it struck my heart, as with a sense of something seen, ah me, 
long long ago and told me that my sight encountered here the token of orestes dearest soul then clasping it i did not cry aloud but straight mine eyes were filled with tears of joy and now as much as then i feel assured he and none else bestowed this ornament to whom beyond thyself and me belongs such consecration and i know this well i did it not nor thou impossible thou canst not worship even the blessed gods forth of this roof unpunished and most sure our mother is not minded so to act nor had she done it could we fail to know this offering comes then from orestes hand take courage dear one not one fate pursues one house perpetually but changeth still ours was a sudden genius but perchance this day begins the assurance of much good oh how i pity thine infatuate mind why dost thou find no comfort in my news you know not where you roam far wide far wide not know when i have seen it with mine eyes dead he is dead look not to him poor girl salvation comes to thee no more from him oh me unfortunate who told thee this he who stood by and saw his life destroyed amazement seizes me where is that man right welcome to the mother there within me miserable who then can have decked with all those ceremonies our father's tomb i cannot but suppose some hand hath brought these gifts in memory of orestes dead o oh, cruel fate while i in ecstasy sped with such news all ignorant it seems of our dire fortune and arriving find fresh sorrows added to the former woe it is so sister Yet if thou wilt, list to me, that thou mayst disperse this heaviness. What? Shall I rise the dead again to life? I did not mean so. I am not so fond. What bid you, then, that I have powers to do? To endure courageously what I enjoin. So it make profit I will not refuse? Remember, without toil no plan may thrive. I know it, and I will aid thee to my power. Then hearken my resolve. Thou seest now we have no friendly succour in the world, but death has taken all, and we are left two only. I, so long as I could hear my brother lived and flourished, still had hope he would arise to wreck his father's blood. But now that he is gone, to thee I turn to help thy sister boldly to destroy the guilty author of our father's death, Hegisthus. Wherefore hide it from thee now? Yea, sister! Till what term wilt thou remain inactive? To what end? What hope is yet left standing? Surely thou hast cause to grieve, bobbed of thy father's opulent heritage, and feeling bitterly the creeping years that find thee still a virgin and unwed. Nay, nor imagine thou shalt ever know that blessing. Not so careless of his life as King Aegisthus, as to risk the birth of sons from us to his most certain fall. But if thou wilt but follow my resolve, first thou shalt win renown of piety from our dead father and our brother too, who rest beneath the ground, and shalt be free for evermore in station as in birth, and nobly matched in marriage, for the good draw gazers to them still. Then seest thou not what meed of honour if thou dost my will thou shalt apportion to thyself and me? For who, beholding us, what citizen, what foreigner, will not extend the hand of admiration, and exclaim, See, friends, these scions of one stock, these noble twain, these that have saved their father's house from woe, who once, when foes were mighty, set their life upon a cast, and stood forth to avenge the stain of blood! Who will not love the pair and do them reverence? Who will not give honour at festivals and in the throng of popular resort to these in chief for their high courage and their bold emprise? Such fame will follow us in all the world, living or dying, still to be renowned. Ah, then comply, dear sister, give thy sire this toil, this labour to thy brother give. End these my sufferings, end thine own regret. The well-born cannot bear to live in shame. In such affairs, for those who speak and hear, wise thoughtfulness is still the best ally. 
true, noble woman, and before she spake, sound thought should have prevented the rash talk that now hath proved her reckless. What wild aim beckons thee forth in arming this design whereto thou wouldest demand my ministry? Dost not perceive? Thou art not man, but woman, of strength inferior to thine enemies. Their genius, daily prospering more and more, whilst ours is dwindling into nothingness. Who then, that plots against a life so strong, shall quit him of a danger without harm? Take heed, we do not add to our distress, should some one hear of this our colloquy. Small help and poor advantage, t'was for us to win brief praise and then inglorious die. Nigh, death is not so hateful as when one desiring death is balked of that desire. And I beseech thee, ere in utter ruin we perish and make desolate our race, refrain thy rage, and I will guard for thee in silence these thy words unrealized, if thou wilt learn this wisdom from long time, having no strength to bend before the strong. Comply, then prudence in a heedful mind. No fairer treasure can be found for men. Thy words have not surprised me. Well I knew the good I offered would come back with scorn. I, all alone and with a single hand, must do this, for it shall not rest undone. Would thou hast been thus minded when our sire lay dying? In one act thou hadst compassed all? My spirit was the same, my mind was less. Be such the lifelong temper of thy mind. Thine admonition augurs little aid. Yea, for the attempt would bring me certain bane. I envy thee thy prudence, hate thy fear. Even when thou speakest me fair, I will endure it. Take heart, that never will be thine from me. Long time remains to settle that account. I find no profit in thee, go thy way. Profit there is, hadst thou a mind to learn. <sighs> go to thy mother, and declare all this. I am not so in hatred of thy life. Yet know the shame thou wouldst prepare for me. No, no, not shame, but care for thine estate. Must I still follow as thou thinkest good? When thou hast wisdom, thou shalt be the guide. Tis hard when error wears the garb of sense. Right, that is the misfortune of your case. Why, feel you not the justice of my speech? Justice may chance to bring me injury. I care not, I, to live by such a rule. Well, if you do it, you will find me wise. Well, I will do it, not dismayed by thee. Speak you plain sooth, and will you not be counselled? No, for bad counsel is of all most hateful. You take the sense of nothing that I say. Long since, not newly, my resolve is firm. Then I will go. Thy heart will ne'er be brought to praise my words, nor I thine action here. Then go within. I will not follow thee, though thou desire it vehemently. None would be so fond to hunt on a cold trail. If this seem wisdom to thee, then be wise thy way. But in the hour of misery, when it hath caught thee, thou wilt praise my words. Exit Chrysothemis. Wise are the birds of air, that with true filial care, for those provide convenient food, who gave them birth, who wrought their good. Why will not men the like perfection prove? Else, by the fires above and heavenly rectitude, fierce recompense they shall not long elude. O darkling rumor, world or wandering voice, that pierces to the shades beneath the ground, to dead atriots waft a sound of sad reproach, not bidding him rejoice. Stained is the ancestral hall, broken the battle call, that heretofore his children twain in loving concord did sustain. Alone, deserted, vexed, Electra sails, storm tossed with rugged gales, lamenting evermore like piteous Philemon, and pining sore for her lost father. Might she but bring down that twofold fury, caring not for death, but ready to resign her breath? What maid so worthy of a sire's renown? None who inherit from a noble race, complying with things base, will let their ancient glory be defiled. So twas thy choice, dear child, through homeless misery, to win a twofold prize, purging the sin and shame that cloud the Argive name. 
so to be called most noble and most wise. Mayest thou surpass thy foes in wealth and power, as o'er thee now they tower, since I have found thee not in bright estate, nor blessed by wayward fate, but through thy loyalty to heaven's eternal cause, wearing the stainless crown of perfectus renown, and richly dowered by the mightiest laws. Enter Orestes and Pylades with the urn. Say, dames and damsels, have we heard aright, and speed we to the goal of our desire? And what desire or quest hath brought thee hither? I seek Aegisthus dwelling all this while. Welcome. The tongue that hold thee hath no blame. Which of you all will signify within our joint arrival, not unwelcome here? This maiden, if the nearest should report. Mistress, wilt thou go yonder and make known that certain phocians on Aegisthus wait? How oh, can it be that you are come to bring clear proofs of the sad rumour we have heard? I know not what ye have heard. Old Strophius charged me with tidings of Orestes' fate. What, stranger! How this terror steals on me! Bearing scant remnants of his body dead in this small vase thou seest, we bring them home. Oh, sorrow! Thou art here! I see full well that burden of my heart in present view. If thou hast tears for aught Orestes suffered, know that he lies within this vessel's room. Ah, oh, sir, by all in heaven, if yonder urn hide him, I give it once into my hand, that o'er that dust I may lament and mourn myself and mine own house and all our woe. Bring it, and give her whosoe'er she be, for not an enemy, this petition shows it, but of his friends or kindred is this maid. The urn is given into Electra's hands. O monument of him whom o'er all else I loved, sole relic of Orestes' life, how cold in this thy welcome is the hope wherein I decked thee as I sent thee forth! Then bright was thy departure, whom I now bear lightly, a mere nothing in my hands. Would I had gone from life, ere I dispatched thee from my arms that saved thee to a land of strangers, stealing thee from death! For then thou hadst been quiet on that far-off day, and had thy portion in our father's tomb. Now thou hast perished in the stranger land, far from thy sister, lorn and comfortless. And I, O oh, wretchedness, neither have bathed and laid thee forth, nor from the blazing fire collected the sad burden, as was meet. But thou, when foreign hands have tended thee, comest a small handful in a narrow shell. Woe for the constant care I spent of thee of old, all vainly with sweet toil! For never wast thou thy mother's darling, nay, but mine, and I of all the household most thy nurse, while Sister, sister, was thy voice to me. But now all this is vanished in one day, dying in thy death. Thou hast carried away, as with a whirlwind, and art gone. No more my father lives. Thyself art lost in death. I am dead who lived in thee. Our enemies laugh. Loudly, and she maddens in her joy, our mother most unmotherly, of whom thy secret missives oft-times told me thou wouldst be the punisher. But that fair hope the hapless genius of thy lot and mine hath reft away, and gives thee thus to me, for thy loved form thy dust and fruitless shade, O oh, bitterness, O oh, piteous sight! Woe, woe, O oh, sent on thy dire journey, dearest one, how thou hast ruined me! Thou hast indeed, dear brother. Then receive me to thyself, hide me in this covering, there to dwell, me who am nothing with thy nothingness for ever. Yea, when thou wert here above, I ever shared with thee in all, and now I would not have thee shut me from thy tomb. Oh, let me die and follow thee! The dead, my mind assures me now, have no more pain. Electra, think, thou hadst a mortal sire, and mortal was thy brother. Grieve not far. Oh, me! What shall I speak? Or which way turn the desperate word? I cannot hold my tongue. 
What pain o'ercomes thee? Wherefore speak'st thou so? Can this be famed Electra I behold? No other. In sad case, as you may see. Ah, deep indeed was this calamity. Is't possible that thou shouldst grieve for me? O oh, ruined form, abandoned to disgrace! Tis me you mean, stranger. I feel it now. Woe's me, untrimmed for bridal, hapless maid. Why this fixed gaze, O oh stranger, that deep groan? How all unknowing was I of mine ill! What thing hath passed to make it known to thee? The sight of thee, attired with boundless woe. And yet thine eye sees little of my pain. Can aught be still more hateful to be seen? I have my dwelling with the murderers. Of whom? What evil would thy words disclose? Of him who gave me birth. I am their slave. Whose power compels thee to this sufferance? One called my mother. Most unmotherly. How? By main force, or by degrading shames? By forces and shames, and every kind of ill. And is there none to succour or prevent? None. Him I had you give me here in dust. How oh, mine eye pities thee this while, poor maid. No now none ever pitied me but you. None ever came whose heart like sorrow wrung. Is it possible we have some kinsmen here? I will tell it, if these women here be friendly. They are, they may be trusted, only speak. Let go yon vase, that thou mayst learn the whole. Nay, by the gods, be not so cruel, sir. Obey me, and thou shalt not come to harm. Ah, never rob me of what most I love. You must not hold it. O oh, me, miserable for thee, Orestes, if I lose thy tomb. Speak no rash word. Thou hast no right to mourn. No right to mourn my brother who is gone? Such utterance belongs not to thy tongue. Oh, am I thus dishonoured of the dead? Far from dishonour, but this ne'er was thine. Is't not Orestes' body that I bear? Nay, but the idle dressing of a tale. And where is his poor body's resting place? Nowhere. Seek not the living with the dead. My son, what saidst thou? Not but what is true. <gasps> Doth he yet live? If I have life in me. Art thou Orestes? Let my signet here that was our father's tell thine eyes I am. Oh, day of days! Time hath no happier hour. Is it thy voice? Hearken not otherwhere. Have my arms caught thee? Hold me so, for I. Oh, dearest women, argives of my home, ye see Orestes, dead in craft, but now by that same craft delivered and preserved. We see, dear daughter, and the gladsome tears steals from our eye to greet the bright event. Offspring of him I loved beyond all telling, oh, thou art come, hast found me, eye to eye beholds the face thou didst desire to see. True. I am here, but bide in silence still. Wherefore? Hush, speak not loud, lest one within should hearken. By ever-virgin Artemis, ne'er will I think worthy of my fear, this useless mass of woman cowardice, burdening the house within, not peering out of door. Yet know that women too have might in war, of that methinks thou hast feeling evidence. Ah, me, thou hast unveiled and thrust before my gaze that burning load of my distress. No time will soothe, no remedy will heal. I know that, too. But when we are face to face with the evildoers, then let remembrance work. All times alike are fit with instant pain, justly to mind me of that dreadful day. Even now but hardly hath my tongue been free. Yes, that is it. Therefore preserve this boon. Whereby? Put limits to unseasonable talk. Oh, brother, who, when thou art come, could find it meet to exchange language for silence as thou bidst me do? Since beyond hope or thought was this thy sight to me. God gave me to your sight, when so he willed. O oh, heaven of grace, beyond the joy I knew but now, if God hath brought thee to our roof, a miracle of bounty then is here. I hate to curb the gladness of thy spirit, but yet I fear this ecstasy of joy. 
oh after all these years now thou at length hast sped thy dearest advent on the wished-for way do not in all this woe thou seest surrounding me what means this prayer forbid me not my joy nor make me lose the brightness of thy face deep were my wrath at him who should attempt it is my prayer heard why doubt it friends i learned a tale beyond my thought and hearing i restrained my passion voiceless in my misery uttering no cry but now i have thee safe now dearest thou art come with thy blessed countenance which i can ne'er forget even at the worst of woe a truce now to unnecessary words my mother's vileness and aegisthus waste draining and squandering with spendthrift hand our patrimony tell me not anew such talk might stifle opportunity but teach me as befits the present need what place may serve by lurking vigilance or sudden apparition to o'erwhelm our foes in the adventure of to-day and when we pass within take heedful care bright looks betray thee not unto our mother but groan as for the dire calamity vainly reported let's achieve success then with free hearts we may rejoice and laugh dear brother wheresoe'er thy pleasure leads my will shall follow since the joys i know not from myself i took them but from thee and ne'er would i consent thy slightest grief should win for me great gain ill should i then serve the divinity of this high hour thou knowest how matters in the palace stand thou hast surely heard aegisthus is from home and she our mother is within nor fear she should behold me with a smiling face mine ancient hate of her hath sunk too deep and from the time i saw thee tears of joy will cease not wherefore should i stint their flow i who in this thy coming have beheld thee dead and living strangely hast thou wrought on me that should my father come alive i would not think the sight were miracle but sober truth since such thy presence then lead as thy spirit prompts for I alone of two things surely had achieved one, noble deliverance or a noble death. Be silent, for I hear within the house a footstep coming forth. Strangers, go in, for none within the palace will reject your burden, nor be gladdened by the event. Enter the old man. O oh, lost in folly and bereft of soul, is that your care for life hath ebbed away, or were you born without intelligence? when fallen not near but in the midst of ill and that the greatest ye perceive it not had i not watched the doors this while your deeds had gone within the palace ere yourselves but as things are my care hath fetched you round now then have done with long protracted talk and this insatiable outburst of joy and enter for in such attempts as these delay is harmful and tis more than time but how shall i find matters there within well you are shielded by their ignorance that means you have delivered me as dead alone of dead men thou art here above doth this delight them or how went the talk i will report when all is done meanwhile no all is well with them even what is evil who is this brother i beseech thee tell dost not perceive i cannot even imagine knowst not into whose hands thou gavest me once whose hands how say you his who through thy care conveyed me secretly to focus plain what is this he whom i of all the band found singly faithful in our father's death he is that man no more oh gladsome day dear only saviour of our father's house how camest thou hither art thou he indeed that didst preserve orestes and myself from many sorrows o oh, dear hands kind feet swift in our service how couldst thou so long be near nor show one gleam but didst destroy my heart with words hiding the loveliest deeds father in thee methinks i see my father Oh, welcome thou of all the world to me most hated and most loved in one short hour enough dear maiden many nights and days are circling hitherward that shall reveal in clear recountment all that came between but to you two that stand beside i tell now is your moment with the queen alone and none of men within 
but if you pause know that with others of profounder skill you'll have to strive more than your present foes then pylades we need no more to dwell on words but enter on this act with speed first worshipping the holy shrines of the gods that were my fathers harboured at the gate they pass within Electra remains in an attitude of prayer o king apollo hear them graciously and hear me too that with incessant hand honoured thee richly from my former store and now fierce slayer i importune thee and woo thee with such gifts as i can give be kindly aidant to this enterprise and make the world take note what meed of bane heaven still bestows on man's iniquity Electra goes within. Lo, where the war god moves, with soft short footsteps onto his design, breathing hot slaughter of an evil feud. Even now the inevitable hounds that track, dark deeds of hideous crime, are gone beneath the covert of the domes. Not long in wavering suspense shall hang the dreaming presage of my wistful soul. For lo, within his lead, with crafty tread, the avenger of the shades even to his father's throne of ancient power, and in his hand the bright new sharpened death, and Hermes, Maia's son, is leading him and hath concealed the guile, even to the fatal end in clouds of night, his time of weary waiting all is o'er. Re-enter Electra. O oh, dearest women, they are even now about it, only bide in silence still. What is the present scene? She decks the vase for burial, and they both are standing by. And wherefore hast thou darted forth? To watch Aegisthus coming, that he enter not at unawares. Ah, oh, ah, oh, woe for the house, desert of friends and filled with hands of death. A cry within. Did ye not hear it, friends? Would I had not, I heard and shivered through. Ah, oh, me! Alas, Aegisthus, where art thou? Hark, yet again that sound. O oh, son, have pity. Pity the womb that bare thee. Thou hadst none for him, nor for his father in that day. Poor city, hapless race, thy destiny today wears thee away, away. What morn shall see thy face? Ah, oh, I am smitten. Give a second stroke if thou hast power. Oh, me, again, again. Oh, would thou were shrieking for Aegisthus too? The curse hath found in they and earth who lie, our living powers today, long dead they drain away, the streaming blood of those who made them die. Enter Orestes and Pylades. Behold, they come, they come. His red hand dripping as he moves, with drops of sacrifice the war god loves. My wildered heart is dumb. How is it with you, brother? If Apollo spake rightfully, the state within is well. Wretched one, is she dead? No more have fear, thou shalt be slighted by thy mother's will. Cease, for I see Aegisthus near in view. In, in again, boys. Where do ye behold the tyrant? To our hand from yonder gate he comes with beaming look. Haste, with what speed ye may, stand on the doorway's stone, that having this much done, ye may do all to-day. Fear not, we will perform it. Speed ye now, follow your thought. We are already there. Leave matters here to me, all shall go well. Exit Orestes with Pylades. Few words, as if in gentleness, twere good, to utter in his ear, that eager and unware, one step may launch him on the fields of blood. Enter Aegisthus. Which of you know where are the Phoenician men who brought the news I hear? Orestes' life has suffered shipwreck in a chariot race. You, you I question, you in former times so fearless. You, methinks, most feelingly can tell us, for it touches you most near. I know, assure thee, else had I not heard the dearest of all fortunes to my heart. Where are the strangers, then? Enlighten me. Yonder. Their hostess entertained them well. And did they certainly report him dead? Not only so, they showed him to our sight. May this clear evidence be mine to see? I envy not the sight that waits you there. Against their want, thy words have given me joy. Much joy be thine, if this be joy to thee. Silence, I say. 
Wide let the gates be flung, for all the Mycenaeans to behold, and all in Argolis, that if but one hath heretofore been buoyed on empty hopes fixed in Orestes, seeing him now dead, he may accept my manage, and not wait for our stern chastisement to teach him sense. My lesson is already learnt. At length I am schooled to labour with the stronger will. The body of Clytemnestra is disclosed under a veil, Orestes standing by. Zeus, divine envy surely hath laid low the form I here behold. But if the truth provoke heaven's wrath, be it unexpressed. Unveil, off with all hindrance, that mine eye may see, and I may mourn my kinsman as I should. Thyself put forth thy hand, not mine, but thine, to look and speak with kindness to this course. I will, for thou advisest well. But thou, call Clytemnestra, if she be within. Aegisthus lifts the shroud. She is beside thee. Gaze not otherwhere. What do I see? Oh! Why so strange? Whom fear you? Who are the men into whose midmost toils all hapless I am fallen? Ha! Knowest thou not thou hast been taking living men for dead? I understand that saying. Woe is me, I know. Orestes' voice addresseth me. A prophet! How wert thou so long deceived? Undone, undone. Yet let me speak one word. Brother, by heaven, no more! Let him not speak! When death is certain, what do men in woe gain from a little time? Kill him at once! And killed, expose him to such burial from dogs and vultures as beseemeth such, far from our view. Not less will solace me for the remembrance of a life of pain. Go in, and tarry not. No contest this of verbal question, but of life or death. Why drive you me within? If this you do be noble, why must darkness hide the deed? Why not destroy me out of hand? Command not. Enter, and in the place where ye cut down my father thou shalt yield thy life to me. Is there no help but this abode must see the past and future ills of Pelops' race? Thine, anyhow. That I can prophesy with perfect inspiration to thine ear. The skill you boast belonged not to your sire. You question and delay. Go in. Lead on. Nay, go thou first. That I may not escape thee? No, that thou mayst not have thy wish in death. I may not stint one drop of bitterness. And would this doom were given without reprieve, if any try to act beyond the law, to kill them, then the wicked would be few. O state of Atreus, how triumphantly through grief and hardness thou hast freedom found, with full achievement in this onset crowned. End of Part 2 End of Electra by Sophocles Translated by Lewis Campbell